Well, we're seeing a huge variety of features here. We have the North Polar region at the top. Uh, we can't see a lot of detail there yet in the images we have, but we certainly see it's quite complex with some old craters, so we know it's a fairly old region, or parts of it are fairly old, but there are scarps, uh, there are uh, color patterns that we don't understand. I think there's a lot waiting to be discovered there when we get better pictures. Um, then closer to the equator we have um, a band of bright and dark regions again with quite a lot of craters that we can see because they have bright and dark markings associated with them. Um, and so again this is fairly ancient terrain uh, but it has some very odd patterns in it. There are fractures we can see but there are other strange squiggly lines that we don't understand yet. Um, we're very much looking forward to seeing the more detailed pictures. And then the very dark equatorial regions, um, which are hard to see in the images we have so far because they are so dark, but they will be uh, easier later uh, with better pictures and uh, appear to be covered in some sort of uh, hydrocarbon residue that's fallen out of the atmosphere. We don't know why it's, why it's concentrated at the equator. And then in the center, we have the famous heart that we're calling uh, Tambor Regio, uh, which is very bright and has two distinct sides to it. Uh, the western side, the left-hand side, is um, very smooth in, in images like this and shows amazing details uh, when we look at it closer up, and I guess we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we know there are mountains near the edge of that region, and then the the... Uh, eastern part of the heart we don't have such good pictures of yet but um, it looks completely different um, it looks like a, a very rough eroded surface and uh, that's about as much as we we know about that region yet but it's an incredibly varied and very interesting place um, this is as close as we can get to the what the human eye would see it's difficult uh, to get exact color pictures because the New Horizons cameras cover blue, red, and near-infrared light, but they don't have blue, green, and red filters that would allow you to make a perfect reproduction of what the human eye would see. So we use the blue and the red color information and some information from the near-infrared to uh, approximate what the green color might look like, and that is the best we can do, and we use the, the spectra taken from the Earth um, so we know it has this uh, pale yellowish brown kind of look to it, um, but the details we don't know. And when we use the infrared light, uh, we can get colors that are not accurate, but show actually quite a lot more variety here. And I think the human eye would probably actually see more variety in the uh, colors than we see in the, this picture. It's the best we can do, though, with the, with the data we have. Um, from the colors, no, we can't identify chemicals directly from those, uh, but they provide important clues as to uh, the processes that are going on. Um, we did expect that those hydrocarbons uh, would be reddish, and they are showing up as reddish, so we see that reddish-brown color in that very dark area in the lower left. Um, uh, but the other colors, the more bluish colors or yellow colors, we don't know quite what those mean yet. Um, the way we get the composition is not so much from the colors directly, but from our near-infrared instrument where we're looking at uh, light reflected between one micron and two and a half microns, where there's a lot of diagnostic information in the spectrum about the, uh, what the surface is made of. And we already knew that by looking from the Earth. So we know there are uh, regions of, there's a lot of methane on the surface, but there are regions of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and um, the, the uh, western part of uh, Tambor Regio, which we're calling Sputnik Planum, uh, we know has a particular concentration of nitrogen and carbon monoxide in it. And so we're beginning to put these clues together and uh, getting an interesting picture. <laughs> no, this is... Uh, at first, we couldn't see any detail in this region at all, um, and that was pretty puzzling. And then when we got started to get the more detailed pictures, we could see a lot of incredible detail, but it's, it's quite subtle from a distance because the surface is so smooth. Um, 
the fact that it's smooth means it's very young. Um, and so some process, some geological process is renewing this surface, uh, recreating it and erasing any of the impact craters that ought to be forming on it. Um, so this was a very interesting surprise uh, to see such a young and dynamic looking surface. Uh, this is such a fabulous image. This one really blew us away when we got it. There's so much interesting stuff in here. Yeah, we're seeing the edge of Sputnik Planum where it uh, reaches a, a range of hills to, that you can see at the top of the image. And you can see that the surface is, is pretty smooth but has all these strange markings in it. And in the upper left, you can see it's very obvious that this material is flowing. It is f flowing between mountains. It's flowing into a little crater at the top of the image there. Um, it's very mobile. Uh, but it also has these strange uh, irregular patterns that look like it is convecting, i.e. it's almost boiling, this warm material coming up, reaching the surface and cooling and then sinking again. Um, and this must be happening pretty quickly because we see no craters here at all uh, in, this, in this region. There may be some, but if so, they're very subtle and hard to see. So this is a very dynamic uh, place. Uh, we don't know how that is. It's probably nitrogen because nitrogen is very soft. It will flow pretty easily, even at the cold temperatures on Pluto, and we know there is a lot of nitrogen on Pluto, particularly in the atmosphere. Um, so this is probably nitrogen, but we're not sure about that yet. Um, we're still working on the spectrum, but it's very dynamic. It's very uh, uh, mobile uh, place, not like no landscape we've ever seen before, uh, even on Neptune's moon Triton, which we might have expected to look a little bit like Pluto, but we, we never saw anything like this. And then to the at the top of this image, the, the highland terrain, the, the, this uh, frozen nitrogen lake, if you want to think of it like that, uh, borders on, is also interesting. It has craters, so it's a fairly ancient surface, um, uh, but it has been heavily eroded. We don't know how that erosion has happened, but there's a lot of very interesting patterns there. And we've just seen a little tiny piece of that region. We'll see a lot more of it in later, later pictures. Well, we think this is probably part of the same process. These polygons may be where the ice is convecting. Uh, it may be that warm material is coming up in the center of each of these polygons and then flowing and then descending around the edges of them. But uh, we, we don't know that for sure yet. And then we see these little hills along some of those boundaries, which is where you might expect the ice to be flowing downwards, and yet something is coming up along those boundaries, or maybe these are mountains that are poking up between the uh, convecting regions and uh, are controlling the convection, but it seems more likely that this is where material is actually squeezing up or erupting onto the surface in these regions. Just, again, totally bizarre, not like nothing we've ever seen before. Well, uh, we're not sure we have a big picture yet, but we do know that we have dramatic high mountains here that are um, many kilometers high. Uh, we don't have exact heights for all of them yet, but they are uh, very rugged. We don't know what process would create these, but the fact that they are so high and so steep-sided means they can't be made of nitrogen. They can't be made of methane that we also know is on Pluto. They are made of probably water ice, uh, because water ice is very rigid at the very cold temperatures of Pluto, and you can easily make giant mountains out of water ice. Uh, so we think we're seeing the bedrock of Pluto here. Uh, maybe many of the landforms are made of, of water ice, but they're covered in these more exotic ices, and then we have this giant um, smooth region of Sputnik Planum that is uh, probably mostly made of these much softer ices like nitrogen. Um, so a very varied place. Um, but yeah, how these mountains got to be here, why they are where they are, have the shapes they are, we have no idea yet. <laughs> it's a, a very surprising place of amazing diversity. 
uh, landscapes we could never have imagined two weeks ago before we got these pictures. Um, and we can't wait to see the rest of the, uh, what the rest of Pluto looks like close up, which we will do in the next few months as the pictures come back. Well, we think the atmosphere is very intimately connected to the surface because the atmosphere is mostly made of nitrogen. It also contains methane and carbon monoxide. And these are also the frosts that are frozen out on the surface of Pluto. And we think the atmosphere is maintained by the continual evaporation of those frosts. Probably Sputnik Planum, um, this huge convecting pot of nitrogen or carbon monoxide and, and methane is playing a big role in that and continually providing more uh, uh, material to evaporate and form the atmosphere. We know you have to continually regenerate the atmosphere because it is leaking into space. Pluto's gravity is so low that um, the atmosphere extends very high such that Pluto can't quite hold on to it. And one of the things that we want to learn more about from New Horizons and don't have much of the data yet is the uh, how much atmosphere is leaking out, what is the processes that are driving the escape of that atmosphere. Uh, but as the atmosphere is lost, it will be re re replenished from, from the surface. Uh, uh, we expect the atmosphere also not just to escape into space, but to freeze out on the winter pole. Pluto's orbit is very eccentric, so sometimes it is much closer to the sun. Right now it's near its closest point. It was closest to the sun in the 1980s and it's just now beginning to recede. Um, it also has uh, a very tilted pole. So uh, sometimes one pole is tilted at the sun and has uh, permanent sunlight, and the other pole is in permanent dark darkness for many, many decades. So it can get very uh, cold there potentially, and the uh, atmosphere can freeze out on that side. So there's a lot of complicated interactions between the atmosphere and the surface that we're looking forward to untangling. Well, we are, uh, the most striking characteristic is the one we already knew, which is how big it is. Um, it's half the size of Pluto. We think it probably formed in a giant impact uh, with Pluto the way our own moon formed with, with the Earth uh, uh, by a giant impact on the Earth early in the Earth's history. So we may learn something about the Earth's early history by studying this other example of that process. Uh, but for what the New Horizons pictures show, they show a fairly ancient surface with uh, uh, completely covered in craters. There are giant fractures that extend around the uh, 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 around Sharon. We don't know quite how far they go, uh, and there are smooth regions between the craters. So some mysterious processes erased some craters. Uh, the others have formed on top of that. So it's, a, again, a very varied world. Um, and then we have this dark reddish polar cap that was nobody expected that. That's something we saw a long time ago on approach, uh, which may have something to do with uh, Pluto's escaping atmosphere uh, freezing out at the poles of Charon on its way past Charon as it leads, leaves the system. Uh, so, But Charon still has a lot of secrets to uh, uh, hold on to and we because we have many better pictures that we we haven't received yet or that we've only received in a very compressed form which don't show all the details um, we're looking forward to seeing more about that um, well these moons are uh, Nix and Hydra are pretty interesting shapes. Uh, they're, they're certainly not round. We didn't expect them to be round, uh, but uh, Hydra in particular has a very lumpy kind of shape. Um, and then Nix has this red spot on it. Um, most moons this size are fairly uniform in color, and uh, Nix is not. There's something else strange going on there. Um, but uh, again, we, we will have better pictures coming, and uh, we just beginning to unravel the story of, of these moons. Uh, we d have learned from Hubble observations that the, uh, these moons seem to have strange rotation uh, patterns. We, we don't think 
that they are simply orbiting, rotating synchronously as we might expect for many moons in the solar system where they always keep one face to their primary uh, because instead of having a single planet in the center of the system, you have this double world with this complicated ge ge uh, gravitational field as these two, as Pluto and Charon orbit around each other, that is continually knocking the moons off balance, these other moons, so they don't settle down into always having one face towards Pluto and Charon. They are uh, being knocked out of that synchronous pattern into some other more complicated rotational pattern that we don't understand yet. Right, uh, we, we've learned uh, whatever we expect will probably be wrong, uh, but we are um, looking forward to finding out what these worlds are like because they are probably building blocks of the solar system that were left out here in the Kuiper Belt where they didn't form into a planet so we can get some idea of the ingredients of certainly the outer solar system and maybe the inner solar system as well by visiting these worlds. Um, we have two objects that we have uh, identified that we can reach with the spacecraft given the fuel on board. Um, we have to decide between those in the next few weeks actually and then in October we will uh, do a spacecraft burn to set a course to one or the other of those objects. We can't visit both unfortunately uh, but we will be uh, then in 2018 or 2019 19 be flying close to one of these worlds and getting uh, remarkable pictures of uh, yet another completely unexplored part of the solar system. We'll also be looking more at more distant objects as we fly through the Kuiper Belt. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at other Kuiper Belt objects from a few hundred, a few tens of millions of kilometers and we'll get information from those that we won't be able to get from Earth even though we won't uh, be able to uh, see details on their surfaces. All right. Uh, well, well, thanks for your interest and good luck with the broadcast.